Welcome back for another episode of Strange, Creepy and Mysterious Things I Found on the Internet. I think we're on episode 6 now, so if you haven't seen the rest, check out the playlist. If you enjoy internet mysteries and generally disturbing content, feel free to subscribe and turn on notifications for more content like this. I also have a Patreon and a PayPal, so if you're interested in supporting the channel, feel free to check those out, links will be in the description. This video is sponsored by Skillshare, an online learning community with thousands of fascinating classes on a variety of topics including photography, film and video, creative writing, fine art, music, marketing, crafts and web development. Whether you want to increase your existing knowledge or learn something totally new, Skillshare's classes are concise, entertaining and they're broken down into short lessons, so if you have 5 hours or 5 minutes, you can learn at your own pace and convenience. All Skillshare classes have subtitles in Spanish, French, Portuguese and Dutch and there's no ads, so you can stay focused and go wherever creativity takes you. I recently took the class Outdoor Photography, See, Shoot and Share the Beauty Around You, taught by Min T and it was packed full of useful information. I really like how he gets you to focus on small details that you might not otherwise notice. The close-up texture of the sand on a beach or the light patterns created by the sun in a car park. It's been a while since I went out with my camera, but I feel more motivated to after learning some new skills. I also like how you can share your own photos and see how other people were inspired by the class under the projects and resources section. If you fancy giving Skillshare a try, which I highly recommend you do, the first 1000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a 1 month free trial. Start exploring your creativity today. This video will contain vague discussions of drug addiction and other potentially triggering topics. Viewer discretion is advised. You can head over to my Patreon for an uncut version of this video, which features a whole extra entry. The story of Spontaneous H is one of the most tragic but iconic tales in Reddit history. I was reminded of it recently when I saw there had been a small update, but before we get onto that, I'll explain what happened for anyone who doesn't know. At the age of 24, H was pretty successful. He had a master's degree and a well-paying job, but his life had been boring for the last few years and he never took any risks. He drank alcohol occasionally and smoked weed a few times when he was in high school, but other than that, he was not a drug user. One day, he was approached by a dealer and decided to buy some weed perhaps with hopes of bringing some excitement to his life. A second spur-of-the-moment decision led to him buying some heroin, hence the name Spontaneous H, and when he eventually figured out what to do with it, he gave it a try. He said the most pleasurable feeling of pure relaxation and bliss washed over him. Everything felt amazing, like being in a pure, conscious, lucid, dreamlike state, and sometimes it felt like he was leaving his body. It was a valuable life experience for him and he said he felt proud of himself for having the balls to do something that crazy. He was blown away by the power of it and until now never understood how people got hooked, but he vowed to resist the urge to do it again, at least for a long time. But that didn't last long at all, as two weeks later he posted again, admitting that he had been using since his first post and just did for the first time. In a series of updates, we see moments of clarity where he clearly knows he needs to stop before this gets even worse, and he temporarily believes he can, but it only seems to be a couple of days until he's using again. The final update on his second post explained that he had found a dealer online who could get him a much better deal. He'd be paying less than half what he was before, as if he needed any more persuasion to continue the habit that was quickly becoming an addiction. Around a month after his first post, he said he was on Suboxone, a drug used to treat opioid addiction, but we didn't hear anything else from him for just over a year. Now he was in a psychiatric hospital after technically dying the week prior due to ODing on various substances. This was the third time in the last year. He was prepared to try his best to kick the addiction, but expected several relapses and struggled to imagine his life without heroin, let alone drugs in general. He admits his past history was a little more colourful than he admitted in the first post. He tried many other drugs before and after her. He was actually looking for another when he ended up buying her and he now realises he was in the depths of a manic episode which likely contributed to his decisions. 
sitting in the hospital, he could finally acknowledge that he had fooled himself into thinking he had some deep spiritual journeys, when in reality it was just an excuse to get high. A couple of days later, H posted another update in which he said he'd be going to rehab the next day, and implied he regretted not listening to Reddit, but doesn't know if it would have made a difference because of his addictive personality. After ruining his education, his job, his relationship, his health, and basically everything else he had going for him, it finally seemed like he was on the road to recovery. Over the next three years, he occasionally commented on other posts about addiction, but then three years passed with no one hearing a word from H. Was rehab successful for him and he just wanted to leave all the bad memories in the past? Or did he relapse and die for real this time? He was lucky to have four chances at life and he said himself he didn't know how many more he'd get. Then in January 2017, he finally broke his silence and revealed on the Opiates Recovery subreddit that he had been clean for almost six years now. He said he didn't want to go back and read his old post because it was difficult for him, but he just wanted to update everyone because he still gets messages. In comments, he revealed that he has managed to rebuild most of the important relationships with family and friends, though when he contacted his ex-girlfriend, she told him he could only make things right by never contacting her again. He was employed again and had been for almost as long as he was sober at that point. Things were rarely looking up. There were a few sporadic comments in the next year or so and still he was doing well. I'm happy to say that in his most recent update, just a few weeks ago, he says he's still alive, clean and doing well. It's been almost 11 years since he used any hard drugs or even drank alcohol. Three years ago he had a minor slip up and smoked weed which he says was a bad mistake, but on the whole that's pretty good going and he should be extremely proud of how far he's come. While there are countless drug addicts that have posted on Reddit, it's rare to see a story unfold over such a long period of time. I mean, the addiction happened pretty quick, but we've had updates over 12 years. There are so many people who have tragically succumbed to addiction and it's been the death of them. While H's journey was certainly a roller coaster, and there were times where it wasn't clear whether or not he'd make it through, it's nice to see a happy ending. There was always some inconsistencies in H's story that made some question whether it was all just creative writing. In his first post, he claimed to have only ever tried weed as a teenager, but in later comments he admitted to a couple binge six months prior to taking heroin, then at some point posted saying he was trying it for the first time. When pulled up on this, he claimed the inaccuracies and downplaying of his history was to protect his identity, out of fear someone who knows him could read all the posts and realise it's him. Some Redditors pointed out that the symptoms he claimed to have experienced within two to four weeks would only have occurred after more long-term use. I don't know enough about any of this to say whether his description was accurate or not, but if you can provide some insight, please do so in the comments. H didn't give much evidence to support most of the details in his story, though he did post a photo of paraphernalia over a screen showing his Reddit inbox. It's possible that he was a user and wasn't totally making the whole thing up, but that some details, such as the length of time it took him to become addicted, were not accurate. Anyway, you can check out his post history and decide if you want to believe him, but whether or not this story is true, it still gives some insight into how dangerous and scary such hard drugs are. Alzheimer's Research UK is the country's leading dementia research charity that focuses on understanding Alzheimer's, diagnosing it, preventing it, treating it, and hopefully curing it one day. Their mission is to bring about the first life-changing dementia treatment by 2025. Since it was founded in 1992, it has run various campaigns not only to make money to fund research, but to educate the public and raise awareness. Although dementia is unfortunately pretty common, as much as 7% of people aged over 65 have some form, there's still a lot that isn't known about it and there are many misconceptions. One being that only older people get it, 5.2% of the UK population under the age of 65 suffer with it too. Anyway, in 2016, the charity launched a virtual reality app called A Walk Through Dementia that was designed to put you in the shoes of someone living with dementia. You can still get the app now if you're interested, but you can't really do a lot on it. You might as well just watch the three clips on YouTube, which are 360 videos. At the time, and possibly even now, you could order a cardboard box to put your phone in, which basically acted as a VR headset, allowing you to move your head to look around in the app. They were trying to make it as immersive as possible without actually making a proper VR game that you'd need expensive equipment for. The app shows three different scenarios in which you are an elderly woman trying to do normal everyday things, going shopping, making tea for your family and walking home. 
You enter the shop and look at your shopping list, but the words start changing in front of your eyes. The word T becomes P, and a note above the list looks like it's rearranging itself. You move through the supermarket, trying to find the items that you normally buy, but you don't recognise them. The layout of the shop isn't what you remember, and you don't know where your son Joe went. You manage to get your items, but when you get to the checkout, Joe appears and asks you why you got biscuits when the cupboard is full of them at home. They weren't on your list and you don't even remember putting them in your basket, but there they are. He goes to put them back, leaving you to pay for the shopping, already confused, but especially so when the cashier starts talking about a bonus card and then says that you haven't given the right money, even though you're sure you counted it right. The supermarket is very cartoony, whereas the kitchen scene at home looks slightly more realistic. You get a call from your daughter, asking you to put the kettle on as they're on their way. She tells you she wants milk and two sugars, one sugar and milk for Tim, milk and half a sugar for Lloyd, and before you have time to process what she said, she's asking if you remember Tim and Lloyd whose photos are on the fridge. You're trying to remember the right combination of milk and sugar, but inevitably you get it wrong and forget to put milk in one, and accidentally put about seven sugars in another, thinking you only put two. The third and final scenario is the scariest in my opinion. It's totally realistic and you're walking home with Joe, who stops to take a call, turning his back on you. You wander off, thinking you can hear someone you know, and eventually get lost. You think you recognise things on the way back, but your vision starts blurring and you feel increasingly lost. A man crosses the road towards you and you think it's Joe, but it's not. Thankfully, Joe is seconds away and when he catches up to you, he continues leading you home until you approach a puddle. For a second, you forget what a puddle is. It just looks dark and deep, like you could fall right into it. So you warn Joe, but he reminds you it's just a puddle. You eventually arrive outside your house, but your vision blurs again and you don't feel like you can face the steps. You blink and you're finally home, which is just a place now, not a feeling anymore. Not only does this app make you think about how hard it is for someone to deal with the symptoms of dementia, but it also highlights how other people act around them. In the shopping scene, Joe is nowhere to be seen for most of the trip, and sounds more confrontational than curious when asking about the biscuits you accidentally put in the basket. The cashier seems to be getting a bit impatient to remind you that the store is getting busier and other customers need serving. At the end of the kitchen scene, one person complains that there's too much sugar in the tea and another complains about the lack of milk. In the walking home scene, Joe is walking ahead in front of you, not with you, and leaves you unattended while he takes a phone call. And when you get home, he leaves almost immediately, even though it's clear you're struggling. This app may not exactly be strange, creepy or mysterious, but it's certainly eerie as it forces you to imagine a life where you can't remember people or something you were just told seconds ago. Nothing looks familiar, you can't even read your own writing. And worst of all, the majority of the world is so ignorant to your condition that at best, they unintentionally make you more confused. And at worst, they start getting annoyed with you and don't make the time to help you, as if any of it's your fault. J.F. LeMay is an artist from Quebec, Canada, who worked as a freelance web designer for 10 years before pursuing his dream of being an illustrator. His work is some of the coolest creepy art I've ever seen, and I just had to share it here. He takes inspiration from H.R. Geiger and Gustave Doré, amongst others, who also focused on dark and morbid themes, but he has a very interesting and unique style of his own. It's so surreal and detailed. Most of his drawings are done using pencils or pens and there's no colour, apart from a few which seem to be collaborations with other artists. A lot of his pictures are his own creations, often showing skulls, skeletons, eyes, bugs, parasites and bizarre creatures, but he's also drawn a variety of well-known characters, including Hannibal Lecter, Bilbo Baggins, The Joker, Darth Vader, Jack Skellington, Pennywise, Spider-Man, Michael Myers, Edward Scissorhands and many more. While JF's static art is fascinating by itself, what really makes him stand out is the animations he creates. I'm not very knowledgeable when it comes to art, so I couldn't even tell you exactly how he does them all. I'm also probably not going to explain this very well, but they often start out with a drawing and you can see a real hand doing something to the paper. Sometimes he's finishing the drawing and other times he might be cutting into a character on the paper, or opening up a face and the characters might react by moving their eyes or the picture somehow changes. For example, one animation shows an autopsy of a man on the paper. The hands cut into the body using a scalpel and latex or something has been used so it can be peeled back to reveal the next layer. The hands cut into the ribcage, a separate layer of paper which is peeled back, 
And finally, we can see some kind of parasite under the ribs. A small amount of dark liquid, presumably meant to be blood, splatters as the parasite is removed. In another, JF makes use of the latex or whatever it is, and another layer of paper again to rip the jaw off her face. He pulls one of the teeth out as blood splatters and the eyes suddenly start moving. There's also one where he quickly draws a spider, puts his hand over it, and as he flips it back over, you can see the spider crawling into his hand. There are so many more and it's such a captivating blend of art and reality. I highly recommend checking out his Instagram, I could spend hours scrolling through all his work. I was recently browsing missing persons cases on Wikipedia when I came across an article about what is known as the Highway of Tears. It's a corridor of Highway 16 in Canada where some estimates suggest that over 80 women have gone missing or been found murdered since 1970. A disproportionately high number of those victims are Indigenous women and it's not exactly clear why. According to Wikipedia, Proposed explanations for the years-long endurance of the crimes and the limited progress in identifying culprits include poverty, drug abuse, widespread domestic violence, disconnection with traditional culture, and disruption of the family unit through the foster care system and Canadian Indian residential school system. Poverty in particular leads to low rates of car ownership and mobility, thus hitchhiking is the only way for many to travel vast distances to see family or go to work, school, or seek medical treatment. Unfortunately, the Highway of Tears is a pretty good place to commit a murder or other serious crime as the area is remote and much of it is isolated. There are plenty of carnivorous scavengers that will disturb human remains, so there's a relatively low chance of getting caught in the act and of evidence being found after the crime. For many years now, there has been a movement to raise awareness of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Not only along the Highway of Tears, but in Canada as a whole, it seems that the percentage of homicides involving Indigenous women is significantly higher than the percentage they make up of the total population. In fact, a 2014 report by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police found that from 2001 to 2015, the homicide rate for Indigenous women in Canada was almost six times as high as the homicide rate for other women. It also appears that these cases are disproportionately reported on in the media and aren't given as much attention from police, resulting in a much lower chance of them being solved. There have been a number of convictions relating to murders that occurred in the Highway of Tears area, including three serial killers, Brian Peter Arp, Edward Dennis Isaac and Cody Lejepikoff. It has been theorised that Bobby Jack Fowler, a rapist and suspected serial killer, may have been responsible for some of the Highway of Tears murders, though he died in prison in 2006 and was never charged with any of the murders. The vast majority of the murders and disappearances in the area remain unsolved. Let's take a look at three of them. Jean Virginia Samper was 18 years old when she disappeared after she was seen by her cousin walking down the Highway of Tears in October 1971. Between 10 and 11 that night, Jean's brother's wife saw her at her mother's house and said when she came out of the kitchen it looked like she was crying and avoiding eye contact. She eventually left and began walking down the highway with her cousin Alvin, who at one point headed to his house nearby to get either a jacket or a bike, with the intention of meeting back up with her. When he returned, he had a vehicle door closed but couldn't see Jean anywhere. Her mother reported her missing the next day. Members of the community began a search for Jean and police later joined in, though after eight days, nothing was found to suggest her whereabouts. The case was closed in 1985 after it was somehow determined that Jean had drowned, even though there was no conclusive evidence to suggest that. So her family complained and it was soon reopened, though no one has been charged in the case since. Running away, participating in any high-risk activities or harming herself were not in Jean's nature, but those theories can't be ruled out due to lack of evidence. Foul play is a possibility, perhaps she had been kidnapped and was in the vehicle that Alvin heard when he returned to the highway. Jean's boyfriend, who she worked with, had gone missing shortly before her disappearance. It wasn't until after she vanished that his remains were found and it became clear that he had drowned in a river. In March 1978, the naked body of 31-year-old Mary Jane Hill was found along the Highway of Tears. Her cause of death was determined to be bronchitis and bronchopneumonia, but the manner was manslaughter, specified as culpable homicide, but not murder, by the coroner, suggesting that someone was to blame for her death, but they didn't necessarily intend to kill her. It might have been an accident or due to negligence. Mary's daughter, who was just six years old at the time of her death, 
believes that someone left her mother on the highway to die for some unknown reason. She believes police could have done more to solve the case and claims that they have never contacted her directly about the case, instead communicating through victim services. She also claims that Mary was buried in an unmarked grave and that she had to search through records to find the graveyard, but still doesn't know exactly which grave is her mother's. 27-year-old Immaculate Mary Basil, known as Mackie, went missing after attending a house party in June 2013. Her family was surprised that she even went to the party as she was an introvert who preferred being at home and spending time with her five-year-old son. She was last seen with her cousin Keith and a man named Victor, though they haven't spoken publicly about what happened and were reportedly uncooperative during the investigation. A popular theory is that one or both men murdered Mackie, Victor's ex-wife didn't speak very highly of him, to say the least, and he has a history of violent convictions and had been charged with at least one sexual assault in the past. Tragically, Mackie isn't the only woman in her family to have disappeared from the Highway of Tears. Nearly six years earlier, her cousin Bonnie Marie Joseph vanished after hitchhiking in the area. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts in the comments, plus any suggestions you have for a future episode. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing. Huge thank you to my patrons, whose names are on screen now. I really appreciate your support. And thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Once again, the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one month free trial. Thanks to you for watching, and I'll see you next Thursday in a new video.